I think my juices flow all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. You know as much as I know. Right now, we've been able to stuff to stuff. The curse is broken. NC State fans, finally. <laughs> finally. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. I mean, that's a triple play. The Wolfpack ain't for soft. It ain't for soft people. Welcome to college basketball season right here on Pack Therapy. I am your host, Joe Giglio, and that is not Mike Lennon. Instead, since it's basketball, we got Wolfpack great Scott Wood. Scott Wood, leading three-point shooter in the history of NC State basketball. Holds a few other records. Most games played, consecutive free throws. He wasn't bad. 2012 team ended up in the Sweet 16. Scott Wood, I appreciate you sitting in and joining me this college basketball season. Welcome to Pack Therapy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me in here. Perfect. We're going to do this real simple because we have the benefit of seeing 11 games already. So we might have had different ideas at the beginning of the season, maybe more of from an ACC view, but from an NC State point of view, 8-3 and three so far, 0-2 oh in the league. What have you seen that you've liked from the Wolfpack this season so far? You know, they're uh... – they're a much more fun team to watch. I think that's the, the the first thing that I've noticed. I think they've got really heavy guard play uh, between Jarkel and Baby T, which you got to have to be successful in the ACC. The only thing that I'm truly, truly concerned about is is our size, our rebounding, especially now with with Dusan going down. Uh, I'm a little bit scared because I've told everybody from the start, even before or just after the Kansas game, I really need to see how the bigs perform in ACC play. Uh, I think that's going to be the deciding factor if they can get into the tournament, if they can be a bubble team, if they can be a contender. So that's my only real fear right now because I think between T, uh, Terquavion, I think Casey brings you enough. Uh, I think they'll keep you in games. It just comes down to will they be able to guard the big and will they be able to finish a possession with a rebound. All right, so Terquavion Smith has the opportunity after an outstanding season to go to the NBA. And depending on who you talk to, could have been a first-round pick. Was it, it was at least in play, right? He decides to come back for his sophomore season. The Pack of Wolves, the NIL deal was a big part of that, that he decides to come back for it. He's got 17.8 points per game. Not what I really want to talk about, though, with the, the player we call Baby T. The five-and-a-half assists per game. I've been really as I've been really impressed with the way that he has improved his passing and his playmaking. What have you seen from him? I know I know we're going to get into he is a shooter shooter, but I am impressed with his playmaking so far. Well, the thing with him is he's going to get so much attention. So at some point he has to be able to make a play for other people. And I also think when he starts to do that that'll open up some things for him because I think last year other coaches and opposing teams wouldn't say he's a willing passer. Right. Now he's a willing passer. I also feel like he has probably a little bit more confidence in this roster to make that pass. You know, Casey's knocked down shots. Uh, Jarkel will knock down shots. He's got uh, – Jack will knock down shots. So he's a little bit more willing of a passer. I also think one big piece to this, uh, which I know we're going to get into as well, is the staff. I think he's got a staff around him that's willing to coach him, willing to say, hey, Terquavion, you got to make that pass. Um, and for a guy like him that's coming back and he, know he knows he can only improve his stock, that, that's a hard thing to do. So the fact that he's been willing to pass, I think, is a, a big thing for the pack because he's got to trust his players around him. I look at NC State, and I one of the big differences I see this year is the point guard play. And listen, I, I'm known for my honesty, and you'll see – and you already know this. When you played at NC State, you were my go-to guy that we I would talk to. You and I are friends. Um, Mike Lennon is our friend. And on this program, Mike Lennon is the good cop. I am the bad cop. I'll just say, you know, Cam Hayes wasn't good enough last year. Yeah. And NC State needed to get more better players. And it wasn't just on Cam Hayes. That's not me blaming all of last year's faults on one player. It was merely pointing out he wasn't good enough. Okay? I think Casey Morsell struggled last year. I think he's shown tremendous progress. I don't know if that is being a year removed from the brainwashing at Virginia or if it's just being more comfortable. Or as you said, there's some better coaching going on, and we will get into some of the changes with the staff. But I see Jarkel Joyner, and I see a significant upgrade at the primary ball handler. 
what do you see? You know, kid played in the SEC, obviously has some seasoning to him, obviously comfortable. You know, a player that Levi Watkins, the assistant coach at Ole Miss, now at back at NC State, somebody you're familiar with. Uh, again, someone we could both call a friend in Levi. What do you see out of Jarkel that's really kind of made a difference for the team this season? Well, and I think even going back to last year when I, I said it um, on my podcast, I think for this team and how basketball is in general nowadays, your MVP has to be your point guard. Mm -hmm. there, there's just so much more pressure on point guards, uh, the style of play, how it's – I mean, when I was playing, you know, we I feel like we did down screens and things like that, yeah. cross screens. Now it's all ball screens. So can you create an advantage on the ball screen and make good decisions? Now you bring in a guy that is, is seasoned, he's older, these are what coaches want, and you can thank the transfer portal because of it, uh, that you have to have. And I think they brought a guy in that's – he's been tested. I think obviously having the connection between him and Levi helps so he can come in and have confidence. Um, but they also have to be a really good leader. And I think he, from day one when he came in, was willing to speak up. He was willing to talk to guys. He was willing to offer advice. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces is he's well-respected um, – and it just helps that, you know, he's a really good player and he makes really good plays for the team. I think you have these two options now, two closers, if you will, in Jarquel Joyner and Turquavion Smith. That helps. Casey Marcel making the progress that he has this year. That helps. But let's get to it. You know, at the end of last year, NC State really bottomed out, I thought. And a lot of people wanted Kevin Keats to be replaced as the coach at NC State. I argued. I felt like Kevin deserved the chance to coach without anything from the NCAA issues hanging over the program. But I also argued this is the year to get it done. And I think really smart thing that Kevin did was bring in Levi Watkins. Yeah. Levi played here at State. He's worked with Bobby Hurley. He worked with Kermit Davis. We mentioned Ole Miss. I think Levi gives you a guy who not only has an experience, but also a guy who understands what this program can be. Yeah. Just a little, just give people a little bit of an insight of what kind of person that Levi is, because he was he was on Mark Godfrey's staff at least your last year, yeah, uh, when you were in school. So you you are familiar with Levi. And again, I don't we're not telling on anybody here. He's somebody we both consider to be a friend. Well, I'm. Um, this is the, probably the first time we'll be on the show together, and I'll be biased. So okay. I, I just want to be very clear on yes. this. Yes. Um. You know, I had Levi all four years I was there. Okay. Um. I I love Levi to death. I was an advocate for him to come from the start. The one thing about Levi is he's an elite, an elite recruiter, you know, because he's been to Buffalo. He's got kind of that East Coast pedigree now where he can go up there and he feels like he can get a recruit because he's been there before. He can do the West Coast because he was at Arizona State, you know, Ole Miss. So he's been in the SEC country so he can recruit there. I think that's one of the things that probably a lot of fans don't fully think about. He's touched the whole map. So now when he's going out recruiting, he's got a little bit more pull because he's been there. You know, he's been in the, what is it, the Pac-10 now? Is it Pac-12? Well, Pac -10? we'll be in 10 next year, oh, yeah. Well, yeah <laughs> once, I don't, I don't even once know USC it, and UCLA leave, I don't even know back. what half of the conferences <laughs> are anymore. Um, and then he's got the SEC, and then he's been up, yep. up north. So I think that's a really, really big piece to it. But I also think even more so, he's a genuine good person, and he's played the game at a really high level. You know, he's been to the tournament as a player. He's lived that life, so he has that respect you know, when you're having those conversations with them. And I think that goes a really, really long way. Keats didn't necessarily have that on his staff. Right. Um, and now you have a guy that's lived it. He's played at a high level. He's gone to tournaments. You're more willing as a player to listen to that because they've gone through it. Also, selfishly, he's somebody that you and I both had a conversation this offseason with Kevin about. Yeah. And said, you know, you need a connection to the program. Uh, and uh, Levi, really, I, I happy that he's back. Yeah. And it's a tough situation still. You and, know? and I will say to piggyback on that, one that we probably won't talk much on is he brought in Torrin. You know, Tor mm -hmm. Torrin, Torrin, yep. Torrin is in there. Again, a younger guy. He he got injured, so that's probably the reason why he's not playing overseas this year. Um, can have those conversations with guys, and that goes a long way. You know, when I was there, we had the Julius Hodges, the Marcus Melvins that were always back in the summer, and now they have a guy that's on staff that, that if they needed to have a – Tough conversation with and someone to shoot him straight, these guys will do yeah. it. We have our personal biases with Levi, that's for sure. But I think Kareem Richardson 
with his experience at yep. Louisville, with Kevin, with his own experience as a head coach, that's a plus for the staff this yep. year. I also think Joel Justice, and we can talk a little bit about this before we hit our, our, our first break here, but uh, Isaiah Miranda is a player I know Joel w- was key in recruiting. He's a seven-footer. Yeah. You know, Dusan Mahorsic with the injury. I'm not, I don't think Miranda is going to come in and, and be Victor Wimbanyama, okay? But I do think the ability to scramble and add somebody shows a little bit of the urgency that I want to see out of NC State this year because I do think Kevin is coaching for his job this year. I do think you have to have that type of urgency. And I love the, the additions that they made in the offseason. But now here at 0-2 with this important injury, you know, it is time to really kind of put the, the you know the gas pedal to the floor here and, and go for this thing because they're only you don't get that many chances at this now. Yeah, and, and I think uh, – I mean, ultimately uh, – I haven't got to know the staff as well as what I've wanted. I've, you know, I've been able to go to three or four practices, get to know a couple of the guys. But ultimately, the thing that I've seen, even in just the four practices I've been to, compared to, to last year or years before, these guys are willing to, to speak up and say something. I think at times last year when I'd go to a practice, you'd look at it and you'd be like, oh, they're not really saying anything. Yeah. You know, they're kind it's of just, just Kevin. Yeah, they're just kind of sitting back. But I feel like now he's got some vocal leaders that are, that, you know, Kevin can listen to now ultimately it falls then on Kevin to to take that advice and say what do we want to use do we want to put this in there do we not want to put this in there that ultimately will fall on Kevin but now I feel like he actually has voices in the room that he can trust rely on and are willing to speak up to the players we're going to talk a lot on this program about the quadrants and Q1 and Q2 and what opportunities matter and I mentioned we're not talking at the beginning of the season so we do have some data And some of those opportunities have already been passed, and some of them are coming up. We'll talk about how this schedule shakes out and what NC State needs to do to get back into the NCAA tournament. We'll do that right after this. So one of my favorite things from the Mark Gottfried era was Mark's true mastery of understanding how to make the NCAA tournament. So Mark was your coach your last two years, right? Yep. All right. And when he was at Alabama, he had missed the tournament the hard way. He had a bunch of wins. He had a good he had like a 500 record in the SEC. He felt good about it. And then he got left out. And he realized it was because of his non-conference schedule. The first team that you were on with Mark that made the tournament, you guys played an unbelievable schedule out of the league. Played the number 1 team in the country outside of the league that believe it or not it was Syracuse right yeah you played Syracuse in Indiana that year and the amazing thing to me was you kept playing good teams you didn't necessarily beat the good teams yeah but you played the tough teams. St. Bonaventures of all teams ended up a game that you guys win at the buzzer ends up being a game that ultimately matters in getting you into the field of 68 so one thing I always give credit to Mark for the got man. I never call him Mark. The one thing I always give the got man credit for was understanding how to get into the tournament. Mm -hmm. But also one of my favorite sayings from the got man was everyone has to play their way into the tournament. No matter who you are, you play your way into the tournament. Yeah. That is the challenge right now for NC state. And the challenge is different in 2022. Once we get to 23, than it was in Gottman's first year with you in 11 and 12. Yeah. And by that, I mean, there were more opportunities in the league. Correct. In the ACC. The ACC was better. Yes. And watching the first month and a half of this college basketball season, I know state fans don't want to hear it, but you want Carolina to be good. Yeah. You want – and you want Duke to be good. <laughs> You want Wake to be good. You want Miami to be good. You want all of the teams you think can be good to be good, particularly out of the league. Because once you get into league play, we saw this last year with Wake Forest. Wake Forest beat Carolina at home and didn't get any credit for it last year. None. They did not make the tournament last year in a very large part because of their non-conference schedule was not good enough. And we saw this with Kevin Keats in 2019. They had the absolute dead last ranked non-conference schedule. They did not get into the league. They did not get into the tournament, in part because that was the year, remember, 
Virginia, Carolina, Duke were all number one seeds, and State lost every game they played against those three teams. Mm -hmm. This is about opportunities. I look at NC State's schedule. This year, Kansas was a huge opportunity. They played well down in Atlantis. They played well against the Jayhawks. They did not beat the Jayhawks. As you know, you don't get credit for good losses. That's not a thing that happens in NCAA, with the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. They, Kansas, number seven in Ken Palm. Ken Palm, net, very similar, okay, when we talk about these things. Q1, Quadrant 1, the, those, are the, those are the good wins. Those are the ones you need. Dayton, Butler, neutral site right now would not qualify as Q1 games. They have to get into the top 50. So that's an issue. Those are their two best wins right now. The other Q1 game would have been Miami on Saturday, another missed opportunity. So you start looking at it, Scott, and you go, well, where will these opportunities come if Carolina can't play themselves up to the Q1? Now, they, they probably will. Right now they're at 25. But you start looking at the rest of the league and you go, where, where are these opportunities going to come from for NC State? I don't, I don't know if they have them. That's, that, that's been my biggest fear from the start. And I think part of it, it kind of falls back to, I don't, I don't know if Kevin knew what he was going to have coming back. Yeah. So he almost had to make a, you know, not great schedule because he didn't know if he'd have a good team or not. So it was his only chance to, you know, if he had to win 20 wins, this is how he was going to do it. And I think right. he ended up getting a really good team, but at some point they're going to have to capitalize on your Carolinas, your Dukes, because there's probably legit, what, four or five that have a chance right now in the ACC to make the tournament? I like, obviously, Virginia and Virginia Tech, I think, are tournament teams. Those are my only two. Duke, out. for sure, has taken care of some of its business that it needed to. Carolina has not taken care of business, but They'll be I, fine. I think it's safe to say with their talent and the group and the, and the experience that they have that they're going to figure it out. Here's the issue, though, Scott. They get two cracks at Duke, home and away. Um, State's record at in Durham is not great since uh, 1987. Yeah. Uh, they get two shots at Carolina, the home and home. And then they get Virginia Tech there. I don't love their chances of winning that game. And they only get Virginia once. And the Virginia game is also there. Now, Kevin's teams have played well against Virginia. Yeah. But this is about opportunity to me. And I'm, I'm, you know, you look at that Miami game on the road and you go, the way that the first half of that game went, you're going, you know what? That looks pretty good. What do you think happened uh, Saturday with that Miami game? Second half. I mean, it just seemed like a defensive breakdown. Second half. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they, they, they just haven't, I feel like even the whole year, they just haven't been a great defending team, yeah. which, I mean, it's kind of been a common theme. Uh, but at some point, they got to get stops because I think eh, this is probably the first time I'm going to say this in two, three years. I don't think their problem is going to be on the offensive end. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're going to find a way to put the ball in the basket. In the past, you'd have five to six minute stretches where all of a sudden they couldn't score. That's not going to be their issue this year. Now it's going to come down to when teams are really concentrating on executing and running their stuff during the what I call – you know, kind of your last five minute stretches, mm -hmm. which is probably the most important. Uh, you know, Gottfried is one that always said, you know, you got the first five minutes of a half and then you got your last five minutes. Those are big minutes. Will they be able to get stops? Um, and I, I don't I don't know if they can. And then it just kind of falls back to the scheduling. It's just like, where are they going to get their wins from? I it, don't I don't think the ACC is going to give them any help. Yeah. And that's where Wake Forest, I thought last year, I was trying to tell Wake Forest fans all along, and they're trying to tell me, no, 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 we have a Londis Williams. And I think Steve Forbes did a great job last year. Please don't get me wrong. This is one of those things that I did le learn from the Gottman, like your non conference schedule. When you're put up on a board, so when you get into the selection committee, I don't know how much you've ever talked to Mark about this. They put, they say a name, right? They'll mm -hmm. say Duke, and they don't even discuss Duke. They just say, yeah, they're in. Okay. And not in a bad way. They, everyone agrees on it. Yeah. But then when they say, well, NC State, okay, well, they've done some good things. All right, let's put them here. And then they'll say Furman. And they'll, okay, well, now we'll put them up on the board. And then you put them up and you compare these teams. And what you're not, what you're looking for are extremes. Either something that's good, that's going to help you, yeah, right? The Q1 wins, the strength, the schedule, you know, what you do on the road, what you do away from home in general. Those are all good things for you. Yeah. But they're also looking for that 363. 
well, wait a second. What if their non-conference strength of schedule is a bad, it's a bad extreme, right? So those are the things when you get put up on that board, you you want good numbers to stand out. You you don't want the extreme numbers going against you. And Wake Forest learned that the hard way last year. And that in part was because of the overall strength or at least perceived strength of the ACC. We saw this last year, Scott, when 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 the league loses those early tests out of the league, right? Yeah. Carolina losing to Alabama. Now, Alabama turns around and beat Houston, so it's not like we're going to, you know, again, shed tears for North Carolina for not beating Alabama. But ultimately, that's the kind of game that's going to help everyone else on the bubble in the ACC trying to get into the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, that's the, the crazy part to sit here and think about it is, and, and I'll ask you the question, if they get to 20-plus wins, do they make the tournament? See, I don't even look at total wins. Well, what I'm saying with their remaining – what they have left, right. I, I don't, I don't know if that'll even get them in with what it is. But that's I, why, like Gottfried, for me, when we were there, we played like Stanford at Stanford. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the hottest gym I've ever been in in my life. By the way, I don't even remember. Um, I just remember looking at that stupid tree. That's all I remember from that game, honestly. <laughs> Uh, who, who, whoever decided uh, – sorry, I'm getting off topic. But, no, you're good. Uh, whoever decided that was a good mascot, I mean, jeez. Uh, but he scheduled teams that if you lost to them, it's not a bad look. Didn't but hurt. all of a sudden, if you win that game, that's a good look. You know, you mentioned St. Bonaventure. He goes to these – the mid-majors that are going to finish 1-2 in their in their conference, and when you beat them, it looks good. And if you lose, it's not as bad, Yeah, you know? And, and that's where I think they have to get is they just got to start figuring out, all right, this team is going to be competing to win their conference next year. Throw them on there. I think if you look at, in a little bit of a defense of this year's schedule, okay? If And now, Furman and Vanderbilt this week, those are two of the yeah. other games that could potentially help, okay? But you look at this schedule, and right now there's only one team in the 300s. Those are the games you want to avoid. Because remember, in 19, when they did get left out, there were one, two, three, four, five, six games against teams in the 300s. Those are the things you cannot have. Now, we look at Mark Godfrey. We look at 2012. That schedule, Indiana, Stanford, Vanderbilt, even a Princeton, to your point, is someone who, you oh, you know what? They're going to be uh, thought of as one of the best teams in the Ivy League. You guys play Texas. The worst team that you played that year was Western Carolina, 241. So, you know, there's got to be a mix, and you got to have the ability, as he would love to say, to play your way in. I want to test you, too. That's my yeah. my biggest gripe with Gonzaga. Gonzaga yes. doesn't get better as their conference goes on. <laughs> I hate to tell you. They're getting worse. You know, the, these, t- these games test you, and, and obviously it's different because the ACC has been a little bit down, but – you got to play those type of teams early on. So when you get into ACC, which again, it's not the same ACC, you got to be ready. And so once we hit the ACC schedule, we're running instead of a slow jog. All right. Before we leave this episode of Pack Therapy with Scott Wood, I'm so happy, happy that he's here joining me. You're looking forward to this basketball season. I know you are. Uh, Dusan Mahorsic, you know, the knee injury, I don't expect to see him again. This season, I don't have an official word on that, but I don't expect to see him. How does NC State use a combination of DJ Burns, Ernest Ross? We're going to see Isaiah Miranda, the seven-footer who they just signed, come in. I Again, I don't know what kind of impact he can make. I do know having another body does help. E.B. Dewana is a guy yeah. we saw a lot of last year, and I would argue can be effective in eight to ten-minute you know, intervals as opposed to having to play the whole game. So it, it seems to me that that has to be the biggest and most pressing issue right now for, for Kevin and the staff is, is how do you kind of make up for that loss of Mahorsic because they had a nice combo going there with Dusan and DJ. You know, DJ can really stroke in my opinion. Yeah, and I think Dusan just brings that added factor that he was really good in the defensive area. Yeah. You know, you could kind of switch him on the guards and you trusted him. So I think that's going to be obviously your biggest – lost there but going forward and obviously I'm not the coach but this is just my opinion you have to start to pair up rotations that for example when DJ's in the game you got to give it to him in the low post you kind of have that instant office offense 
So you got to pair him now with more defensive-minded guys. So that's maybe where Jarkel and Baby T get your your break. You know, I like Eby. I think he's probably now your best defensive big yep. that you have on the lineup. When EB is in the game, now you have to supplement the offensive side of it. So he's got to play with a T. He's got to play with a Jarkel. So he just kind of has to find that that right lineup to kind of fill in where your bigs are going to struggle because I feel like he has two bigs and Ernest as well that it's just about as extreme as you can get. You've got really, really good offense on one side, solid defense on the other side. So now where can we supplement and kind of eliminate their weaknesses? Scott Wood, we got an interesting week of NC State basketball. Tuesday it's against Furman, Saturday against Vanderbilt. We'll talk again next week. We'll set up the game against Louisville and maybe what's going on with Louisville. They but, stink. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll we'll see if it remains that way. Appreciate everyone for listening. Obviously, during the football season, once again, thanks to Mike Lennon for all of his help. We'll, we'll obviously have a bowl special, so we won't have all Scott the rest of the way, but we'll have a bowl special. Catch us wherever you get your podcast: Apple, Spotify, the Googles, you name it, we're there. You can watch us on WRLSportsFan.com. You can also check out our YouTube page. I'm going to put all of our episodes of Pack Therapy on the 99.9 The Fan YouTube account. See everyone next week.